Good evening, everyone. I'm Mary Chappett. I am the program director for the Family Caregiver Support Programs at the Department of Aging and Disabilities. And I'm so glad you could join us tonight and that you're in my hope your nice warm homes or your nice warm space. You didn't have to come out in the cold to um, join in with us tonight. So during this Thanksgiving week, I'm grateful to be able to introduce you to tonight's speaker, Jim Krimple. Jim is the community outreach coordinator with Anne Arundel County's Office of Emergency Management. And I would also like to share with you that not only did Jim agree to do the presentation tonight, he actually volunteered to do it. And we don't get many speakers that come and say, hey, I'd like to do a presentation for you. So we're really, really grateful, Jim, that you're joining us tonight. And while you do your presentation, I'm going to go hide and uh, be quiet. And folks, if you have any questions or comments while Jim's talking, please feel free to share in the chat box and I'll let Jim know uh, your questions or what your comments are. Ready for me to begin? Okay, can somebody from the audience uh, confirm that they can see this clearly and can see my uh, mouse move? We can see it clearly, Jim. All right, very good. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, as Mary mentioned, my name is Jim Krempel. I'm the Community Outreach and Volunteer Coordinator for the Anne Arundel County Office of Emergency Management. Uh, we're located in Glen Burnie. Uh, we're in the Hind Building, which is the public parking garage next to the courthouse. Uh, right across from AACC and, and the Glen Burnie uh, ice rink. Uh, we are there to plan for any major emergencies uh, and then respond to it uh, and then recover from it. That's the whole thing we're going through with the, with the pandemic right now. Tonight, I wanna to talk about a worst case scenario that we jokingly call snowdemic, where we have a major snowstorm during the pandemic, but it's no joke at all in preparing for it. And this presentation has been specially set up for caregivers. If you don't know, this is National Family Caregivers Month, November. So this is perfect. I'm very, very glad to have volunteered to give this to you. I'm going to give you a lot of information tonight, but don't worry. I'm going to send Mary a copy of this whole presentation, plus she's going to record this. And she can send this to you as a PDF file. And there'll be a lot of links on that file that you can click on and you can find a lot more information. So don't worry about trying to take notes. You'll get a copy of all of this. If you have any questions, just stop me, uh, get on the chat box uh, and or Raise your hand if Mary can see it and you can even speak, that's fine too. So this is a typical natural disaster that in our office would face. So this time of year, we're actually, believe it or not, still in hurricane season. It lasts till the end of November. And we actually have an active tropical uh, depression out there in the Atlantic. It's not gonna go anywhere. We've had a record hurricane season with 29 named hurricanes this year. We're deeply into the uh, Greek alphabet, which is the second set that they use. A snowstorm is typically what we get. It's localized. Parts of the county will get hit more than others. And it usually happens over a few hours, perhaps a day or two. All of you have probably experienced this if you've lived here. It may have some physical destruction in block roads or utility outages. It could involve some injuries, especially for car accidents or something. And the lead agency is usually the fire department. Our responders or hospitals themselves are not in danger. It could have financial impact if something happens to your home or business. And long-term recovery is not usually likely for something like this. Our emergency operations center would be activated from one uh, day to about a week. Uh, in this case, this is very, very different. Our emergency operations center has been activated for eight months. And in fact, during Hurricane Isaias, if you remember the tropical storm that came through, we actually operated two separate emergency operations centers, one for COVID, one for the tropical storm. So what makes this different? Well, as you know very well, the impacts are around the globe all the way to your own family every part of our normal lives have been interrupted. And we don't really know how long this is going to last. Uh, there's a lot of speculation out there. I'm not going into it, but there, it could last for years. There's really no direct physical destruction from this. Uh, the long-term public safety orders that we have have never been done before. So the fact that we're being told to mask, that at bars and restaurants have to shut down at a certain time, and that's enforceable by law, uh, that's really never had to be enacted before. So that's unique too. And our lead agency for this is not the fire department or the police as normal, it's the health department. So as we say in emergency management, they're, it's, they're the lead emergency support function, health and medicine. 
And in this case, our responders, as you know, in our hospitals are themselves in danger. And in fact, that's one of the real dangers we're facing right now. If we keep growing uh, in the number of people who are infected and get sick, then we're going to overwhelm our hospitals. At some point in time, it'll be so overwhelmed that other people without COVID will be impacted to include uh, some major medical emergencies. And, and sadly, that's happening in a number of places around the country now. Maryland's doing pretty well, but there are a number of places that are not doing well. This is going to have widespread impact and the recovery will be years long. So as you can see, it's a very complex disaster. It's more than just the public health. Uh, it's created homelessness and joblessness. That's led to domestic violence. That's led to food insecurity. We are feeding 300 times more than the normal level of hungry in the county. In fact, that's one of the things I'm doing tomorrow is spending uh, uh, most of the day down in, uh, in Annapolis uh, feeding the hungry with the Department of Aging. Uh, it's interrupted the economy and business tremendously. A lot of places have closed. Some of our restaurants and, and bars have closed completely. We'll never get up again. Our mental health has been stressed. And of course, at the same time, we've had a lot of social protest out there. And so there's mass, most mass protests going at the same time. Uh, and then we have the election on top of it. So it's very complex. Our county, though, is pulled very well together. Uh, one of the things we do is pull 28 different agencies together, again, with the health department leading for this. And we have our EMS responding. Uh, you see they're in their personal protective outfits. And we have our testing facilities here. We have drive up and walk up testing. I'll get into that. We have volunteers. And all of you are welcome to volunteer if you have spare time. We have trained volunteers who operate our call center. They're taking calls from the public and, and actually uh, arranging for testing and test results. We have other volunteers working at the food bank. Our county food bank, believe it or not, has now up to 4 million pounds of food that they've gotten out since this begun to people who are hungry. Because homelessness has occurred, we have our social uh, services and health department out there uh, feeding and helping the homeless on the street. And of course, in our emergency operations that are, you've seen our county executive, Mr. Pittman, and our health officer, Dr. Kali Araman, there uh, giving uh, updates and, and guidance and instructions. They do that from our emergency operations center in Glen Burnie. So that's COVID for now. We'll go back to it. Let's talk about the weather for a while. So Maryland has some extreme weather. So we do have extreme cold, although we haven't faced much of it recently. So if everyone will get in the chat box uh, and, and type in what you think the coldest in the history of Maryland has been. The coldest single temperature in the history of Maryland. Take a guess. I'm watching. 20 below was a guess. Uh, minus 12, minus 25, minus one, minus 10. Keep going. We've got several for minus 10. Okay, so those that were minus 10, you're close. Minus nine is the coldest that's ever been here. But the coldest in the state of Maryland, believe it or not, is 40 below zero. And that was out in Garrett County in the 1800s. It doesn't do that anymore because of all the climate changes. But it can get very cold. Uh, the other thing is, of course, blowing snow. It can reduce visibility and make driving dangerous. This is what I think is about the worst is ice storms. We'll talk about that in a second, because that causes a lot of different things in addition to dangerous driving. We can, of course, have heavy snow. If some of you were around in 2011, we had the two 18-inch snows. We had to post hole just to get around to, to clear off the rest of your house. And of course, we can have freezing rain, and that can, can cause uh, ice jams, which are blockages of frozen ice, and behind it, running water. So you get both a little flooding and a little ice break there. So all these things can happen. As you see, when I give you the PDF for this, you can click on this when you get the PDF, and it'll give you a lot more information on all of these things. So you can drill down and find out as much as you want. So some quick weather terminology. So you'll hear the term outlook. So for example, last week, our outlook was for unusually warm weather. Uh, we actually had spring-like weather. And then we had uh, a period of uh, a lot of rain and very high winds. And then that uh, got colder and colder. Uh, we had some near freezing. And then we're it looks like for this week, it's going to be rainy on Thanksgiving, but then it's going to get chilly and clear again. An advisory is a weather hazard that causes an inconvenience. Well, the Weather Bureau says an inconvenience, but the National Weather Service doesn't make a trip from Baltimore to Washington or from Anne Arundel County to Howard County if there's a half inch of snow on the ground. That could be more than just a nuisance. So in that case, plan carefully. A watch means severe weather is possible. 
So in that case, stay tuned to your weather information and we'll talk about that and be ready to take action. And of course, a warning means severe weather is either happening or is very likely. And it could possibly be life-threatening. In that case, take action. And we'll walk you through all of this. Now, as you go through all of this, I want you to think in terms of three ways. First, think in terms of yourself as an individual, then in terms of the person you're providing care to, assuming you are, or if you're being given care, again, think about yourself, and then think about your family and your community. So we're gonna do this in many levels. A lot of this also applies to business if somebody's uh, at work in business. So winter storm warning, as you see across the bottom, five inches within 12 hours or seven inches in 24 hours, ice accumulation is enough to damage trees and power lines, and then life-threatening combination of snow, ice, and wind. And we get some of those occasionally. A nor'easter is where we've got a front that's coming in from the Atlantic that causes rain, snow, and strong winds, and it could cause coastal flooding. And the biggest example of that I can give is Superstorm Sandy back in 2011. And believe it or not, all these many years later, they're still cleaning up in parts of New York on that. That was a perfect example of a nor'easter, and we occasionally get those. A blizzard everybody thinks of is really deep snow. It isn't. A, a blizzard is uh, snow blowing uh, with the winds of 35 miles an hour or more, and therefore the visibility is less than a quarter mile, and it lasts for three hours or longer. If you hear of a blizzard warning, it's an automatic absolute to stay home. Do not go in driving in it. Uh, it can be extremely dangerous to, to drive in, but it's not based on snow depth. And I think this is the worst for this area, ice storm. So you've heard the, the flooding thing, turn around, don't drown. But we also say quarter inch or in a pinch. So at a quarter of inch of ice, there's enough to make sidewalks treacherous, uh, to make driving treacherous. And around here, it doesn't take a lot to make driving treacherous. But what it does, as you can see in this slide, is it builds ice on the power lines and on trees and it starts to bring them down. So we start to have power outages on top of everything else. So we call all that cascading effects. And if you look at this laundry list on the left-hand thing uh, side of things that could happen during a major snowstorm or winter weather, and you can read through all these. As each one of these happen, it creates yet another problem that goes along until you've got a lot of different intertangled problems that all the county agencies, our citizens, and our nonprofits have to work with. Plus now, we have the coronavirus, which is why we call it snowdemic, the pandemic. And then if you're a caregiver, you have the concerns of taking care of the person or persons that are under your charge. So all of this comes together in what we call cascading effects. So let's take first things first. So the very first thing is we say, your highest priority is to protect yourself. Can anybody tell me why that is? It's not because we're selfish. Why is it so important to protect yourself first? Either, either unmute yourself or, or come on the, uh, on the chat box. You have to be healthy or you can't take care of nobody else. That's exactly right. If you don't care, take care of yourself, you can't take care of anybody else, whether it's somebody you're trying to take care of or your own self or your own family. But what else happens if, if you get sick or hurt? Somebody has to take care of you. So you're taking an emergency responder away from somebody else. So first protect yourself. That's not being selfish. And then go ahead and secure the person in your care. I assume you have one person in your care, you may have more than one. I assume most of you are family caregivers, but some may be professional. It doesn't make any difference. This applies all the way across. At that point, then secure your whole family. So yourself, the person that's in your care, dependent on you and your whole family. And then you can safely check on your neighbors. So we work from in out. Right now, my wife, Gail, is recovering from uh, five spinal surgeries. And then they discovered she had ovarian cancer. She had surgery and four months of chemotherapy. So she is pretty much down and out. And I am her full-time caregiver, in addition to working for the Office of Emergency Management. So I have some idea of what most of you are going through. Uh, hopefully, uh, like my situation, it will be temporary. But, but it does make a difference if it's temporary or, or for a long time. Take care of yourself first. So we talk about COVID. So everybody should know the symptoms of COVID right now. Uh, the symptoms of COVID compared to the flu, compared to allergies, uh, compared to even a cold, there's a lot of similarities. Uh, the biggest indicator though is fever and a shortness of breath. And this is relatively new, a loss of taste or smell. Now that just doesn't mean that your nose is stuffed up, you can't smell as well. It means that things that you should be smelling, you can't smell at all or they smell very strange. 
Those are three potential indicators of COVID. So if you've been exposed to somebody that's been positive, if you feel ill, if you think you have any of these symptoms, then you get tested. If you're like I am at over age 65, you have to look if you have chronic health conditions. But it's not just older people with chronic health conditions. There's a lot of younger people who are getting sick and they may not get sick bad up front, but it causes a lot of secondary effects, sometimes showing up weeks or months later. So we ask you helping to slow the spread. Are you prepared to support your family and the person you're giving care to and you're willing to support your neighbors? So most importantly is to slow the spread. Very easy, wear a mask. As the governor says, wear the mask, damn it. So if you wear a mask and I wear a mask, we've reduced the chance of spreading the germ, the, the virus by 70%. That's not politics, that's science. It's a really simple thing to do. It's a lot more comfortable to wear a mask than it is to be intubated. Trust me, I've had both. Then use social distancing, keep uh, six feet apart from each other. Now six feet apart is very easy. Hold your arms out to your side and then touch somebody next to you. If your fingertips are touching the fingertips of the person next to you, you're six feet apart. If you're in a grocery store, it's about a shopping cart length, a regular shopping cart. It's kind of easy to, to judge that. And then wash your hands. Now I'm gonna, I'm gonna sound like I'm talking to children, but it's really important. People don't wash their hands right. So the right way to wash your hands during this is the way the medical profession does for 20 seconds. So you get running water and a nice lather of soap and you do what you normally do on the outside of the hands. Then you do the inside palms because that touches a lot of things. Then you do this and this to get your fingers. Then you get your fingertips with that soap and water because that's usually what you touch things with. And the last thing you do is again, do this and rinse off thoroughly. Now, 20 seconds, do you have to count to 20? No. Sing the happy birthday song to yourself twice. You can sing it out loud if you want to, but that's what a, a doctor's tip that they do. So sing happy birthday to you twice, and that'll give you 20 seconds. If you're using a, a not a soap, but a hand sanitizer, make sure it's 60% or more alcohol and go through the same routine that you do. Thoroughly clean your hands. And then probably the most important thing I can tell you is get a flu shot if you haven't yet. They're out there, they're free. Uh, you can get them at, at most drugstores, at your doctors, and the county is giving it away for free in drive-in clinics. Uh, we don't want two pandemics. One is entirely enough. Uh, if you're uh, over 65, then you'll get what's called a quadrivalent shot. Uh, it's a little more oomph on the shot uh, to, to actually help you out as an older person. Again, we're slowing the spread of not just coronavirus, but of the flu. So everybody that's gotten a flu shot, please type in yes into uh, the, the chat box. How many, have, how many have gotten your flu shot yet? Nobody's typed in, oh, yep, I've got to see one, two, three, four, about five or six yeses so far. I did. Yep, we're getting a lot of yeses here. Good, that's the right answer. COVID's bad enough without adding flu to it. Good job on everybody that's gotten one. If you haven't, there's many places to get them. Uh, we also do testing. So when you get this, we're gonna give you, if you click on this button, it'll take you to the health department and it gives you all the absolute latest telephone information. But if you call that number, which is manned in our emergency operations center, then you'll be directed to either where you can get a test or you can actually uh, go ahead and get a reservation for a test. And then that's where they give you uh, the feedback of whether your test came back positive or not. So we have multiple sites across the county, drive in and walk in. All of them are free. You don't need a doctor's note. You don't have to have symptoms. And there's a few that have no appointment. Now most have appointments because the crowds are getting large. The results are three to five days. So that's pretty good turnaround. Some parts of the country are seven to 10 days. So we're doing all right here. So we've talked about COVID. Now let's move on to winter health hazards. So I'm gonna use older people as an example, since I am an older person and face that, but really any citizen out there, and especially those who might have a disability are affected by this. So we have to think of winter illness. So we've talked about COVID and we've talked about the flu, but remember there are a lot of other things going around in the winter too. You tend to be in closer quarters, you're indoor, so you can catch something. So you've got to be careful about that. Then we talk about exposure and hypothermia. We'll talk about that. That means you've been outside for too long and, and your body can't fight the cold. We'll talk about falls, which is really one of the greatest ways that people get hurt during winter months. It doesn't take a lot of ice or snow to make things slippery. In fact, even rain can make things slippery enough to fall. 
And then there's certain activities that you probably shouldn't do or the people in your care shouldn't do. So the first thing you do is plan for cold weather, mostly common sense. Check the weather and we'll show you how you can do that. So keep in tune and find out what the weather's going to be. If you're in a warm residence, if your home is warm, uh, then you're doing fine. Uh, you shelter in place there, especially during a storm. If you need to, we'll talk about it in a second, you can evacuate to warmth. Bundle up, mask up, and limit exposure. So these masks you wear are good for COVID, but it also keeps the cold air from getting into your lungs. So it's a two for one. Stay on cleared paths. So uh, it's bad enough that, that you have uh, some kind of disability, but be careful if you're slipped there. And travel together. Two is better than one. If someone's hurt, the other can call for help. Always let uh, others know where you're going, whether it's to the store or a walk around the block, especially if the weather's not good and ask for help for winter tasks. So I have a heart problem, I'm not doing shoveling anymore. So I have a snowblower or I ask my son or his kids to come over. Uh, eat healthy and stay hydrated. A lot of people think because it's cold, they don't need to have as much water. So we say drink, drink water, drink as much as you need to to stay hydrated. Uh, what you don't wanna do is to drink alcohol and you don't wanna drink a lot of sweet drinks because they'll actually make you more hydrated. So if you see the thing where the, the St. Bernard comes up with a, a cask of rum around its neck, that's really not a good thing to do. That's the whole wives' tale. Very important that you know your health and you know your limits. So talk to your doctor. If you're a caregiver, make sure the person in your care knows their limits too. And then keep an eye on one another. So we're all in this together, where it's, whether it's COVID uh, or whether it's, it's just taking care of emergencies that crop up. When we say keep an eye on the neighbors, do it safely. So if you're checking on a neighbor, wear your mask and keep your six foot distance, but make sure you check on each other. We're our own first responders. So wind chill is what happens when the cold robs your body of heat. So normally 98.6 is actually normally a little bit lower than that is your normal body temperature. If it gets to 95 uh, degrees, that's not a lot of difference or below, then what's happened is your body cannot recover. It starts to shake, which is the very first sign you get uh, and then you start losing a cold at a very high rate. You lose your cold, it's an old wives tale, even bald headed me, off your head. In reality, you lose most of your cold from your head and torso. And what happens then is your organs start to shut down. And that's called hypothermia. Hypothermia is a very serious condition uh, at any age, but for, especially for children, for older people. So if you're out walking with a friend uh, or with the person you're giving care to, and they seem confused, they start shivering uncontrollably, they have difficulty speaking, they get very sleepy when they shouldn't be, and they get very stiff muscles, they become rigid, then all of that might be signs of hypothermia, or it could be some of them signs of a stroke. In any case, you wanna get them into warmth and safety and don't make any chance, don't take any chance, call 911. Uh, let the 911 operator talk you through this and get you help quickly. Very simple to do. And of course, the way to prevent that is to dress for the weather. So if it's chilly, you dress in lightweight clothing. If it's colder, you layer up. And if it's extreme cold, then you add uh, multiple layers and a nice warm hat and gloves and nice warm boots. Again, you lose most of your temperature out of the core and your head, so, so dress up. So I've been a Boy Scout leader for 35 years. Our new and they wear a very heavy coat in cold weather. So they start to play, they start to work out, uh, they start sweating, what do they do? They take their coats off. When they take their coats off in the cold, they don't have anything on but a t-shirt, then the t-shirt is wet with sweat. It starts to wick that cold, that warmth away from your body very quickly and increase the cold. The smart ones learn to dress in layers and you can too, and that's how you stop the hypothermia. Again, if you have any questions, by all means, stop and ask a question. So winter falls are something else we have to work about, worry about. So these are some of the risk factors to think about. So some of these are pretty obvious if you're older, and you have a disability, you're probably in a little more hazard there. Uh, if you have previous falls, it might be an indication you're susceptible to more falls. So in a lot of cases, when we go into the hospital or see your doctor, you notice they'll ask you if you're older, have you had any falls recently? You may have a chronic medical condition that would cause you to fall, especially if you're using multiple medications. It could cause you to be dizzy or drowsy. And then believe it or not, one of the risk of falls is fear of falling because in that case you get too hesitant and you can actually uh, cause yourself problems. That's why we say walk in twos. Again, common sense, take care in risky locations. And the riskiest location in bad weather is getting out of a car. When you first get out of a car, 
you may be standing on a patch of ice and you go right down. Uh, be cautious and allow for extra time as you're moving and then change your walking style. Move more slowly, open up your gait, open up your, your leg spacing, wear nice uh, stable boots and walk slowly. Walk in small steps and have somebody with you. Dress appropriately, obviously, because you don't want to get uh, hypothermia, but you also don't want to be exposed to the elements if you fall. And always carry your cell phone with you. You can always call 911, they can come get you. We keep saying walk with a companion time and time again, clear the walkways, and then ask your doctor to assess your risk or the person in your care's risk of falling. That's very important, they can give you some good hits. And of course, we talk about avoiding hazardous activities. Again, I say I have a heart problem, I'm 67, so I don't shovel anymore. But if you do shovel, here's some common sense things you can do. Uh, I'll send you a copy of all this, you can follow this. Uh, but one of the things we talk about if you do shovel is lift a small amount at a time. And what you do is you push the snow along and then lift it by a small amount instead of getting a 20 pound shovel worth of snow and causing that stress on your body and your muscles. Hazardous activities, meaning prepare for the unexpected. So hypothermia happens a lot of times when people don't expect a change in weather, temperature, wetness, or especially wind. If you use a snowblower or a chainsaw, those can be extremely dangerous. Make sure you know how to use them or get some assistance. We don't, again, you already have enough problem with the snowstorm and COVID. You don't wanna add another emergency to that. And then, as we said, drink plenty of water, avoid nicotine, caffeine, and alcohol. Use those in moderation. They can actually uh, cause you to lose your body temperature even faster. So the county operates warming centers. Uh, when the weather presents itself as, as a, uh, a hazard, when it's really cold, uh, and COVID restrictions, restrictions allow, we'll open a warming center. During the day, we can open the senior activity center and the libraries. These are closed by law, and the libraries right now are closed by law. So right now, the only thing we would open is our district police stations. These are not shelters. We have a separate shelter for the homeless. This is for somebody to get in when they don't, excuse me, when they don't have warmth in their home. Uh, it has restrooms, it has water, and has comfortable seating. There's no food there unless you bring snacks in and no pets are allowed except for service animals. You can bring your children or grandchildren in, but they have to be under adult supervision. So right now, if we declare this, it'll be in our police stations, but normally during no COVID, then we use our activity centers and our public libraries. So we've talked about the hazards. We've talked about COVID. We've talked about some of the hazards of snow and winter weather. Now let's talk about preparedness. What can you do for yourself, for the person you're taking care of, for your family and for your neighborhood? It, it means make a plan, build a kit, be informed to know, plan and act. And we'll go through this. So the very first thing you do as a caregiver is, if you haven't done this yet, and hopefully most of you have already. So have a support network. You're not alone in being a caregiver. So talk to other members of your family, friends that you trust, uh, professionals, either medical professionals or, or people like myself or Mary who do this for a living. And there are a number of support organizations that we can talk about later that are out there to include our Department of Aging, which are there to give you assistance. Look at emergency plans, taking into consideration the special medical needs of the person you're taking care of, plus yourself and other members of your family. Don't shortchange yourself. Look at mobility issues and equipment that might be needed. And this one's really, really important, especially if somebody has trouble communicating. Uh, if, they're, if they're deaf, perhaps they're blind, perhaps they, they have a, a, a cognitive disability. So they have to be able to receive and understand warnings and emergency guidance. But they also have to be understood by first responders. So if a paramedic or a firefighter, a police officer, or a doctor's talking to them, you're not there, then you have to work through helping them out. And we'll talk about that. Have evacuation plans in place, we'll talk about that. And if the person in your care or yourself uses a service animal, then, then you have to take that into account. Look at any special considerations, such as simple things like evacuating a building. So it could be your home, it could be a doctor's office, it could be the mall. Where are the emergency exits? Uh, does your person in your care or yourself use emergency or medical equipment, such as a wheelchair? And is there special needs for transportation? So these are the things you have to think about in, a, in broad strokes for planning. If you haven't yet, again, I'll leave this with you. You can think about this and get back to us if you need any assistance. So the next one you plan is for medical needs. 
excuse me, so somebody has disabilities or chronic illness, they have to plan uh, carefully and early. So work with the person you're taking care of and your family well ahead of a snowstorm, since we're talking about snow. And you have that support network. So engage everybody in your support network. Keep an up-to-date list of prescriptions, dosages, and known allergies. And if you can, keep a one-month supply of all prescription medications on hand. That will be not only getting you through uh, the five days or so it might be closed roads in a worst case for a snowstorm, but also can help you in the pandemic. Uh, most doctors are pretty good about giving that right now. Make sure that you and the person you're giving care to and your other family members, that trusted group we talk about, have the phone numbers for the doctor and pharmacist for yourself and those you're taking care of. If you have special medical devices like hearing aids, make sure you have extra batteries. Keep an extra cane. My wife has a folding cane she keeps in the car now. If somebody has a medical alert bracelet, make sure they're wearing that, especially if you go out. And if you have an emergency response system, the call beeper around your neck, uh, make sure that works. Test it beforehand. If you need extra batteries, make sure you have that. This is important. Uh, during a snowstorm or any other major emergency, if you have home health care services, professional services come in, medical services, they may be interrupted. So you have to plan for that. And of course, we talked about special transportation needs. So you may need to drive somebody or you may need to have somebody drive you. Before the storm, if you use oxygen, call your supplier. Make sure you have some spare oxygen bottles on hand and also cannulas for the nose and masks. Talk to supplier about replacements. In a lot of cases, they will not come out during a storm. And if you use a concentrator that uses room air, then make sure you talk to your doctor about how to use that properly and make sure you have extra batteries. So the person who uses that plus their caregiver or family member knows how to, needs to know how to do that. If you have essential uh, electrical medical equipment like an LVAD or CPAP device, uh, or you have a home dialysis machine, then make sure you know about backup power and those that are helping, if you're a helper, know how to do that. So teach those that you trust to help you with the backup power. If you have a generator, that's fine. Make sure it works and it's safe. If you don't have one and you have one of these devices, relocate to a place that has reliable power. If you need special needs uh, with electricity, you can call BGE that number, or if you're deaf, you can use that number or call 711. And during emergencies, you can actually use their hotline. They will, allow, they will try to concentrate on your neighborhood to bring you power quicker uh, to the best of their ability. So they really do try to help us. BG is, is one of our trusted partners. Again, if you have any questions, please stop me. I'm giving a lot of information. So if you have an urgent medical appointment, let's call it dialysis. So inevitably during a snowstorm, we'll get a call at the emergency operations center from somebody who says they have a dialysis appointment tomorrow morning and they have nowhere to get there. Well, the first thing we ask them is, have you called your clinic to see if the appointment's still going? In many cases, the appointment's been canceled. Uh, most of the time, people can, can get by with a week before the next dialysis. So call in advance to see they'll be open and, and what, how you fit with their plans. See if your treatment schedule can be adjusted and are there any backup uh, providers or locations you can use? Then how will you or the person you care get to the clinic if you do have an appointment? Can you drive yourself or does a caregiver have to drive you? And if you still need assistance, you can call the Department of Aging or the Office of Emergency Management because we do have ways to get to you uh, and we will provide help if you need it. But it's best to go ahead and be prepared in advance. Everything I'm talking about during this entire presentation is common sense and being prepared in advance. Some people uh, are in care of people who have uh, developmental disabilities. Uh, it could be autism, it could be par uh, Parkinson's uh, that in, in fine, uh, fine motor skills, it could be Alzheimer's disease, any number of other things, Down syndrome. Uh, so you have to have a family emergency plan taking into account everything I talked about and make sure the person knows how important it is to wear a face mask. Uh, even even uh, two-year-old children, uh, if taught very carefully, will wear a face mask. Uh, give them simple uh, steps to take if there's a disaster based on your family plan and tell them how to exit the house, especially in a fire, and how to call for help on 911. And in reality, in this county, anyone can call 911 on a cell phone or a house phone and use three words, I need help. They don't have to say anything else. At that point in time, the 911 operator will lock in your location and send a responder out to check you. And then if you have somebody that has developmental disabilities, 
uh, teach them what to do if they're separated from their caregiver or family member. Most of you have probably done that, but, but it's something to think about if you haven't. Some people have sensory disabilities, especially those with autism. So teach them about encountering first responders in an emergency. Sometimes all of the noise of the sirens and the unique situation of an emergency will overload their sensory system. So sight and sound, and it will make them afraid. So you can talk them through doing that. Uh, you can give them handheld electrical device, electronic devices that might have movies and games to calm them down. And believe it or not, if you have a small pop-up tent, you can actually put that if you have to move to a different location and it decreases the stimulation for things around them. It's quiet in the tent. Uh, they could have headphones as shown here for this young man. You can give them comfort snacks. These are all proven ways with people that are on the autism spectrum. And if some of you uh, have somebody you're taking care of on the spectrum, there are some really, really good classes out there that concentrate on emergencies for, for those with autism. And if you uh, have somebody in that condition, I'll be very happy to send you information on those classes. There's another thing you have to consider with people with developmental disabilities, we call it elopement. And that doesn't mean you're going out getting married without having a church wedding. That is the tendency of someone with dementia or developmental disability to wander away from safety. So these are a number of things you can think about. So obviously you have to think of the risk factors uh, that they may face and, and where it is you live. So for example, a lot of people with dementia are attracted to water. Uh, so if you have a swimming pool or a lake or a, or a stream uh, near your home, that's one of the places you can look to find them if they wandered off, uh, but also one of the dangers that you might be facing. Again, have that safety plan in place Ensure somebody is always available to keep watch on the individual. So remember, you can't be on duty 24 seven. So make sure having somebody there to back you up, a family member, or another caregiver. Secure your home. You might install alarms or put safety door locks on and determine if there's a pattern to the wondering. This is something, a stressor or stimulus that triggers somebody for wondering whether it's somebody with Alzheimer's or somebody with autism. And then teach them to go to a place of safety. It could be a place in your home or someplace right in your neighborhood. It could be going out to a tree near to your house or neighbor's house. Simple safety skills, to stop when asked, to say their name and phone number, that's really all they need. And, and again, give them a medical bracelet or have a ID or a wearable traffic, tracking device They even have those where you have a small GPS unit and can track them. Another way to distract them is to offer them interesting activities as a preventive measure. And then if they do wander off, keep up-to-date information and photos uh, of you as their caregiver, their family, and for emergency responders. So we have such a thing you've probably heard called a silver alert and an amber alert. Uh, a silver alert is for those that have developmental disabilities and wander off. An amber alert is for a child that is either lost or sadly, in some cases, kidnapped. And of course, you can always ask professionals for help. So that's elopement. So there's always a question whether you should shelter in place with those you're preparing or evacuate. So if your home is, home is warm and sturdy, plan to stay there in a winter storm. You're going to be safe and comfortable most likely. Never shelter alone if you can be helped. So let's say that the person that you're taking care of has been moved to safety somewhere, but you're now alone in the house. You don't wanna be alone. You wanna, you wanna be in there with at least one other person you trust. If you evacuate before the storm, think about that. If you live alone or have a disability, or you have that electrically powered life-saving equipment and have no generator. You might wanna think of moving. So know your destination and where you wanna go. Inform your support network of your status that you're leaving. Put together a go bag, we'll talk about that and consider your pets, especially if you have a service animal. For people with special needs, there's a number of things in this list you can see. And again, a lot of this are things we've talked about already. And when you get that, you can click on here, it'll give you a lot more information. Again. Please stop me if you have questions. I'm going very quickly with a lot of information. So this is a family communication plan. Your communication plan should include you, the person you're, you're taking care of, your family members, extended family, trusted friends and trusted neighbors, then work and school contacts, and then doctors, pharmacies, and other important people. Put the list in your phone, but also have a written list because if your phone battery is down, you don't have your list. Come together with a family switchboard operator. That's somebody out of the area or out of state 
who takes calls from all your family members. So if you're in Odenton and somebody else is in Towson and somebody else is in Howard County, you might all reach the same person who might live in Frederick. And all you have to do is tell them who you are, where you are, and what your status is. During 9-1-1-2001, I was down at the Pentagon when the Pentagon was hit. And all of our lines were overloaded immediately, our voice lines. But, but the short message system that runs texting uh, went through. So text is more reliable. Again, who you are, where you are, and your status. And here's Aunt Mabel. She's at Cousin Joe's in Towson, and she's safe and comfortable. So everyone knows that she's okay. But you could also say, this is Jim. I've decided to relocate to warmth. I'm going to my son's house in, in Columbia. That all makes sense? Again, common sense, but it's common sense thought of in advance of an emergency. This is your emergency kit. And you say, oh my Lord, look at that long list. Well, as you read through this, you'll find most of this is things you have around the house already. What you don't think to do is bring things together. And if you're looking for non-perishable food, like crackers or candy or, or other things uh, that, that don't go bad uh, without refrigeration, uh, have a five-day supply and get them in, and put them together in advance. You don't want two days before a major snowstorm to try to go to Safeway or Giant and find those shelves, uh, the shelves bare, and you know that. Uh, we'll talk about a hand crank radio in a second. That's about the only thing you might not have. Uh, and then have a flashlight or headlamp with extra batteries. Please don't have candles. Candles have the chance of creating a fire hazard. And again, you don't want to create an emergency on top of an emergency. Have a family first aid kit to include your prescription medicines. And again, try to have one month's supply. For COVID, have two surgical or cloth masks for every member of the family, including yourself and the person you take care of, and a set of surgical gloves. And then have hygiene items, soap, the 60% alcohol hand sanitizer, and extra toilet paper. Go ahead and get it now while you can. And of course, the rest of this is common sense things. If you have important family documents, like photo ID, your medical forms, your passports, keep them in a waterproof bag so you can, you can evacuate with them if you need to. We say have a whistle to signal for help. Uh, during the hurricane down in, in uh, uh, New Orleans, uh, they actually had a number of saves where people had emergency whistles. They were too tired to yell for help, but they could blow for help. Remember, the signal universal is three times. So three times blowing on a whistle repeatedly, three times honking your car horn, that's an emergency signal. Some people don't think if they, if they have canned goods and they have an electric can opener, make sure you have a manual can opener. They still have those. And then have a paper roadmap if you have to do an evacuation to a place you don't know. Uh, if your GPS goes out or your phone goes out, you have to have them. And we say keep uh, cash or traveler's checks on hand. How much cash is up to you? Now, if you don't have this emergency kit, you can bill this over time a little bit at a time, or you can go in with a neighbor or a trusted friend and share the wealth of uh, the cost of doing that and build the kit together. So our kit is down in our basement, which is our emergency shelter. And we have enough for my wife and I, and my son and wife and his two kids have one at their home. And they're my backup. So if something happens to me uh, as a caregiver to my wife right now, then our emergency plan is to go to my son and, and his wife and they take care of things. So again, that's an emergency plan, very common sense. So to be prepared, you've got to stay informed. So we're blessed by having a lot of good TV and radio stations here. We have some really good weathermen. And then we have the emergency alert system. Now the emergency alert system is what you hear periodically on TV and radio. It's a very irritating, eh, eh, eh. forgive me for doing that, but that's what it sounds like. You've heard it. That's called the unlock tone. That actually opens the system. And then listen very carefully. If you hear a high-pitched warble afterward, they're going to give you emergency information. Most of the time, it's weather information uh, for a uh, or tornado or a storm warning. It could be for a snowstorm warning or a blizzard warning. But pay attention if you hear the tone. It'll then give you information. You can go back to radio and TV and find out what to do. Or you can go to our social media. There's our website at the Office of Emergency Management. That's the health department website for COVID information. And there's Department of Aging and Disabilities that so you can get help on everything we've talked about. In our office, I'm actually paired with a 21 year old. So uh, she's granddaughter, I'm grandpa, and we work together as a great team. So I do all this, all the face-to-face uh, -face outreach and she does all the social media. So we're on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Nextdoor. So I'm always curious, I always ask, 
How many people on this call use Nextdoor or even know what it is? So go ahead and type in the chat box. If you don't know what it is, it's a neighborhood to neighborhood social media. Some people love it and some people find it irritating. So I'm just curious how many use it. A couple said they never heard of it. Uh, somebody has next door on their phone, but most people aren't, aren't aware of it. So again, probably everyone's heard of Facebook. Uh, Facebook started out for, for college kids and is now mostly used by older people, although there are a lot of others on it. Uh, Twitter is what the president uses all the time, and that's a, a way to get short messages back and forth. Instagram is typically what our teenagers are using now. Some of you may be on it. And there are a number of other social medias, but these four are the ones we use. And we will send out preparedness information, warning information, and guidance during and after an emergency through these things. So you can always go here uh, and, and go to these different sites. And again, Nextdoor is a neighborhood kind of thing. Uh, generally, it links uh, neighborhoods in a certain area, a, a local community. And people put in there things like uh, lost dogs, lost animals. They're selling something. Uh, there's car break-ins. Maybe the police have some kind of warning of something going on. Uh, we, in emergency management, will put out information too. So it's another way to get information. Now, NOAA Weather Radio, I don't know if you've heard this or not, but the National Weather Service operates a 24-7 broadcast system. It talks about the weather 24-7, 365 as a robot voice. It's very clear. Uh, that's the frequency for this local area. But now, the more modern ones, they're not expensive. You can put in a, a same code, a messaging code, and that's the code for Anne Arundel County. It'll only trigger for Anne Arundel County. In fact, you can put in what you want to trigger for. Only trigger for severe storm warning, only trigger for snowstorm warning, uh, whatever you want to tailor it to. It also is part of that emergency alert system. So it's not just weather, we can send other emergencies. Inexpensive, so the one I use, uh, it cost me about $25, I got it on Amazon. And they have some that have assistive technology. So they have flashing lights, they actually have digital messages. So if you can't hear things, you'll see the light and get the message. So they're a really good way to quickly learn things. And I recommend everybody get one. Uh, the one I has has a crank on it that uh, even if the batteries go out, you can crank to get power. It'll also recharge your cell phone. So it's a really good, simple way uh, to get emergency weather. Now, here's a way that's totally free that some of you might use. You may know this in the past as code red. That was the system we used to use. Uh, this is our mass notification system. It's called Alert and Arundel. And you can sign up if you're not on it by going to the website here or just call our office and we can sign you up manually. Now, our county no longer uses sirens. Anybody guess why we don't use sirens? Anybody want to either chat box or, or just come off uh, on your speaker? your microphone, why don't we use sirens? No guesses here, I don't think. Okay, so we don't use sirens. Anybody want to come off uh, mute and tell me? Give their opinion of why? Someone just said that the deaf can't hear. Yep. People that have sirens disabilities. Work. Somebody thinks sirens were ignored. That's the biggest one. They're completely ignored. Most people can't hear them, not because of disabilities, because they have TV and radio on uh, in their car, in their homes. And the other thing about it is a siren doesn't tell you what the emergency is. It just says, hey, there's a warning for something. So instead, we use this mass notification system for your cell phone. It gives you uh, emergencies, and there's only five agencies that use it. Our Office of Emergency Management, the Fire Department, the Police Department, Public Works, and the Health Department. Now, if, if the Department of Aging has information they need to put out, they can come through us and OEM, we'll put that out. Now, the beauty of this is you can get it in text as a voice message or an email, and we have multiple options. You can pick and choose what you want to learn about, and we believe it or not, do it in 21 different languages. There's a lot of people in the county now uh, who speak other than English, so everybody can probably guess our second highest language in the county is Spanish. That's about 15% of the population speaks some degree of Spanish. So just as a guess in the chat box, can anybody guess what the third most prevalent language is in our county now? French. French? That's a good yeah. one. That's, that's about fifth. Oh, fifth. Oh, 
<laughs> and a lot of Canadians speak French, and, and some people from Africa speak French. So my guess Chinese. That's about the third. Good guesses. What do you, I'm sorry, that's about the fourth. Uh, what do you think the third is? Close to China. Korea. I'm Korean. That's it. Hangul. Uh -huh. So about 7% of our population speaks Korean. So we now have 21 languages that can get this information in. Now, the beauty of this system, if you're in a doctor's appointment up in Towson and there's an emergency at your home down in Odenton, you will get that information pushed to you and you'll know either to take another route or maybe set it out. So you'll get that information. Also very good for children. So we're recommending anybody age 12 and above that has a cell phone, put this on their cell phone. Absolutely free. Uh, we don't share your information with anybody and there's no commercial anything with it. Any question about that? So we talk about pet preparedness. Now, two ways to think about this, your pet as the one that you love, a family member in your home, or it could be a service animal that provides a service to somebody with a disability. We talk about pets. In fact, it's federal law that we have to talk about pets now. Uh, first, because we love them, but also because, well, why do you think? Why do we talk about pet emergencies? Is it just because we love them? Anybody take a guess? Don't want to see them die. Absolutely. You love them, you don't want to see them die. So what's happened there is some people have actually gone back in their homes in an emergency, and the fire is the most common, but, but during a hurricane or a snowstorm, when they've evacuated and they're safe, they've gone back into their homes to get their pet. Some of you might remember about uh, three years ago, four years ago, uh, the major flood they had in Ellicott City. And they had uh, old Ellicott City virtually washed away. A lady's dog went into raging water and she went in to try to get the dog to safety. A gentleman, a young man brought she and the dog out, but he fell to his death in that water. He was a Maryland National Guard Sergeant and he got the Soldier's Heroism Medal for it, but unfortunately it was posthumous. So go ahead and do your planning for your pet emergency kit and plan to evacuate with them. The other thing can happen, especially during uh, something like a, uh, a hurricane, a long-term storm, is if they get out, they get hungry, they can turn wild, they can go wild, it's called feral. And if they're feral, they become dangerous. And then that pulls responders away to have to take care of them so they can pose a danger. And again, I keep saying the same thing over and over again. Do things that don't add another level of emergency to the already complicated cascading emergencies we have. Any questions about pets? Jim, somebody had a, a good comment too. They said people generally won't leave without their pets. So well, that's you know, they need to be prepared. That's exactly right. We have people who have literally refused to leave their homes in a fire until they get their pet. So it's best to be able to grab your pet and take it out with you. Or if you have to evacuate to someplace warmer or safer, take your pet with you and prepare for that in advance. So we have a cat box for our cat because he won't res readily travel in the car, but we can get him out quickly if we need to. Good, good point. So power outages, if you, if you have a snowstorm, we have an ice storm especially, you can plan for the power to be out for a while. Uh, notify BGE of your outage, there's a number, or you can call 711 if you have a hearing problem. Uh, and then you can also go to their website. Now the website has a way to report your power outage, but it also has a map that shows where the outages are and their best guess is when they'll bring it back up again. It also talks about what their priorities are in bringing uh, power back on uh, uh, from the, from the uh, uh, transmission lines all the way to your neighborhood. Watch out for downed trees, treat any downed wire as a, an active power line. So especially in wet, weather, rain or snow or ice, we say you wanna keep 40 feet away from a live power line or potentially live. 40 feet is four car lengths. So if you see a down line, stay four car lengths away from it. And if necessary, call either BGE or 911. If they're sparking and smoking, obviously call 911, but they talk to each other. We've talked about before, don't use candles. Don't accidentally cause a fire. Use flashlights, headlamps, or battery-powered lanterns, and make sure now with your emergency supply, you have extra batteries. Keep your cell phone fully charged before the power goes out. And you can even get either a crank phone like I talked about, or the, uh, the weather radio that'll charge a phone, or you can build, buy one of those little blisters. It's about the size of a cigarette pack. You can plug your phone in. It'll give you a boost of energy to make a 911 call if you need to. All your medical equipment, as we talked about before, have spare batteries for, like hearing aids. And then 
keep your fridge and freezer doors closed and turn to the maximum cold. Now, we say food in refrigerator can be kept cold only about four hours. Anybody guess why it's so little? If you have, this is a hint, if you have kids or grandkids, why only four hours? I'm gonna guess it's because they're always opening the door. Yep, it's human nature to open that door. So they're gonna go in and they're gonna grab something, they're gonna grab some soda, they're gonna grab some water, they're gonna grab some milk, they're gonna grab some cheese. They're gonna grab a sandwich that's still in there. Um, and every time you open the door, it's gonna reduce the amount of temperature it'll keep. So what we talk about is, is keep that food in the refrigerator for four hours and then afterward those things, now hard salami and hard cheese, that'll be okay, fruit will be okay, but anything else you, you have to suspect it. Uh, don't wait for it to smell bad. If in doubt, throw it out. Because again, you don't wanna add food poisoning to the whole list of other things that could happen to you. Now a deep freeze, either the freezer side of your refrigerator freezer or a deep freeze is good for about two days. You don't go into that as often. Uh, everything's packed together and it's really cold. If this happens during a, a below freezing event, you can always take some of your food food and put it into a, uh, an ice chest and, and put it outside. And if, if the temperature stays at or below freezing, you'll be okay for a couple of days. So that's a backup for you. If you have a generator, make sure and have it professionally installed and safely operated. So we say at least 15 feet from windows or doors or other ways, because again, you don't wanna add carbon monoxide poisoning to a list of other things can happen. That's a theme I keep saying again and again and again. It applies to you, it applies to the person you're taking care of and to your family. And again, when you get this, you get a click here to BG&E that has a lot of good information. Almost finished. So the fact you're on this call means you're involved in your community, even during the pandemic. I salute all of you because either you are a caregiver or you're a part of a family that has a caregiver or you're somebody that needs a caregiver and you're paying attention to taking better care of yourself in an emergency. So I can give this or a whole host of other preparedness presentations to your local community group, your church, your scout group, your PTA, whatever. We do this all the time. We do it on weekends, we do it in the evenings, we do it during the weekdays. We have a group called a Community Emergency Response Team, CERT. They're volunteers who help the county, but they also give advanced preparedness training. No age limitations, and they do take people with handicaps all the time. Uh, the only age limitation is you have to be 18 or above uh, to serve the county. Very, very good training. It takes everything I've talked about and puts it on steroids over three days. You can volunteer for a community service activity. So the big one right now is feeding. We have a lot of people that have been pushed into poverty and therefore need food at all ages with all socioeconomic groups. So if you want to volunteer to help with feeding, uh, you can give Mary a note and she can send it to me and I can hook you up with organizations all over the county that need that help to include the Department of Aging. So Mary, you know who, who does that. Jennifer and crew will do that. Yeah, and, yeah, I do, yeah. We send her volunteers literally every day of the week. Of all ages, by the way. Keep a safe and watchful eye on your neighbor. Remember, if you check on your neighbor, keep your mask on, keep your six foot distance, and then share good ideas and lessons learned. I wish we had more time because I would love to talk to you all face to face and hear some of the other lessons you've learned from the past but you can always send an email to Mary and she can send it out to everyone else because I'm sure all of you have had good experience and learned hard lessons. Set the example by observing the COVID precautions and then by being prepared. Again, big thumbs up to all of you for being on this call and being more prepared. And the last thing and probably the most important thing we always give caregivers is take care of yourself. If you can't protect yourself and take care of yourself, you can't take care of others. Right. So seek support from other caregivers. Talk to one another. You are not alone. Uh, this caregiver group and Mary does an absolutely amazing job. Uh, that's the right number to reach you, Mary, isn't it? Your office? Yes, it is. Yeah, reach out to her anytime with any question. You can always call our office too. Uh, take care of your own health because you have to be strong enough to take care of the loved one or the person you're protecting and accept offers of help and then offer help to other people. Learn how to communicate effectively with doctors and providers. Sometimes, especially if you're new to this. So when my wife had her uh, five 
uh, spinal surgeries, I had to learn to speak uh, surgical. Then I had to learn to speak the, wor the world of, uh, of uh, bone surgery. And then later on cancer, as did she. It's kind of a scary thing, but they worked with us and we're learning now. Caregiving is hard work. You know it is. So we say take respite breaks. That means a breather for yourself. So have another family member take care of the person you're taking care of for a while and you take a day or so off. Or if you need more than that, then there's other ways we can get help for you. Watch out for signs of depression in the person you're taking care of, but in yourself. And don't delay of getting professional help. It's out there for you. A lot of it's free. There's assistance. You might need in-home health care if you don't have it. Uh, and be open to some new technologies. There are a lot of things like the fact we're talking on Zoom. Uh, six months ago, we never would have dreamed on doing this in Zoom. I would have done it in person only. And the fact that all of you are on here and sharing in this is, it shows how technology has come along. And finally, all of you, all of you, give yourself a thumbs up and a big round of applause for doing the best you can in truly one of the toughest jobs there is. Here's some good resources. Obviously, uh, Mary and her group uh, at the Department of Aging Disabilities. Uh, this is the Maryland Caregiver Group with a lot of good information on it. Uh, the Red Cross has a really good pamphlet here that you see that talks about disabilities and, and special needs, both for the people who have a disability and for those taking care of them. Uh, FEMA, the Federal Emergency Management Agency, has a lot of good information. And this is a really good one for somebody that has not just autism, but other sensory disabilities and, and even uh, 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 Alzheimer's and other disabilities. And of course, the Alzheimer's Association has good information too. So a lot of good resources. So when you get this presentation in PDF, a lot of links you can reach out to and get more. You can always call me and always call Mary. So we wrap this up by saying, are you ready? So who's the caregiver in this? Is grandpa giving care to the child? Is the child giving care to grandpa? And what is wrong with the picture? Can anybody tell me what's wrong with the picture? Nobody? Granddad's got to pull that mask up. There you go. Whoever said that, you're right. Oh, yeah. The mask has to go over the nose and under the chin, and it has to fit snugly. It's funny that the three-year-old has it on correctly, but the 70-year-old doesn't. And that's, that's why I'm joking with saying, who's the caregiver and who's the person giving care? A lot of information in a short amount of time, but I'll send this to you as a PDF file, and all the links will be active. So you can get a lot more information from that. If you need anything or have questions, you can call our office or you can call Mary. If you have a group that you want us to give this to, uh, an American Legion, a church, a PTA group, and a neighborhood association, just let us know. We do this all the time. We do it by Zoom. We have a lot of other different presentations too. And if you have a small business, we have one especially for small businesses. Any questions? You can either come off on the microphone or you can uh, send it to Mary. It has been absolutely my pleasure to do this for you. You are very good. Anybody have questions? Got a couple thank you here. Thank yous. Great presentation. So remember Thumbs the up to you, Jim. The very most important part that we showed is that slide. Take care of yourself. Protect yourself. You're not being selfish. You can't help anybody else if something happens to you. And so with that, I want to say God bless. I want to reiterate. I'm sorry. I just want to reiterate what Jim said. So, you know, take care of yourself. You hear that from me all the time. But, you know, especially now, wear your mask, use your hand sanitizer, mm -hmm. wash your hands, keep your distance from others. But at the same time, even though Thanksgiving is probably going to be very different for most of us this year, I hope you have a very blessed Thanksgiving. Um, I hope you have a wonderful holiday season. We'll resume our caregiver workshops um, in February. We're gonna take a little bit of a break before the holidays and uh, after the holidays so we can see how things are going, but we're gonna be back with our, um, our workshops in February, but the support groups will be continuing. So we don't take a break from support groups. So please join us and again, take care of yourselves. And Jim, thank you so much. That was really wonderful. So thank you all for being here. I wish you a Merry Christmas, a Happy Kwanzaa, a Happy Hanukkah, whatever your religion might be. Uh, have a very blessed Christmas and, and holiday season. Bye-bye now. Bye-bye, everybody. Bye. See you, Mom.